Okay, so I know we've been talking about for the last four hours or so, uh, common variant associations. Everything we've been doing has been in the GWAS realm, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about when we're looking at things that are not really covered by GWAS, and these are rare variants. So to briefly outline why do we even wanna study rare variants and maybe some of the challenges that, are, uh, that you get when you're looking at them, and then I'll tell you two main ways to go about it, and this is just in theoretical, you're not gonna have to type anything in a plink, uh, and the two ways are to look at an increased burden of rare variants within a gene, for example, or an over-dispersion of events, but we'll get into that. So let's say you did a GWAS. What happens if you get something like this? This is real data. So schizophrenia back in 2009 had 2,600 cases and roughly 3,300 controls, and there are zero genome-wide significant loci. It was trimmed properly, it was qc properly, there's just nothing here. Well, you could incorrectly assume that that means common variation isn't playing a role here. We know that when we add more samples, we pull it all out, but given the fact that you only have the 2,600 cases, this is what you see. So one of the things that people might wanna look at next, since this, these are the cases you have, is rare variants, and this is only one of the paths. The reason for that is that common variation with small effects just didn't really work out, so maybe rare variation that's more likely to have larger effects will. So when I say rare variation, that's kind of been a sliding window. Back in the day, it used to be less than 5% for a minor allele frequency. Now it's sliding down to one or a tenth or a hundredth of a percent. The main point here is that if you take a large collection of individuals, you're only going to see a variant from the reference at that location once or twice in thousands of people. So these are ones that you can count on your hands usually. So the reason that people might wanna look at this is because there are a bunch of them. You have a bunch of different rare variants across the populations, across all of the different populations. And deleterious variants, since they're bad for you, are likely to be rare. If you're thinking about evolution selection, if something's that bad and it pops up, you're not gonna see it in half of the population. It's just not gonna be there. So it's going to be one of these really rare variants. Uh, so they're also gonna have a large phenotypic effect for that reason, or a larger one than maybe some of the common ones. However, a kind of downside that used to be more of a downside is that you have to sequence. So the chips that Ben was talking about at the very beginning of the day, those don't really capture these. However, sequencing technology is getting cheaper and cheaper, so this isn't really a con anymore. So this is a large collection of variants where we're probably gonna have some deleterious ones that are waiting for you to analyze them. Unfortunately, when you use all of those tools we were talking about earlier today with all those common variant association tests, you get a QQ plot that looks like this, which is kind of sad. So this is the expected test statistics on the X, the observed on the Y, and if it follows the null, it's supposed to follow this line, but this is below the line. So that means that the p-values that we're seeing, those test statistics, are actually not even what we're expecting to see. It's deflated, and the reason is because we don't have enough counts. This is really bad. Again, this is real data from schizophrenia. Similar number of cases and controls from that GWAS from earlier. Uh, the point, though, here is that these are minor allele frequency 1% or less, so they're considered kind of rare. Well, dang. The big issue here is that the classic single locus association does not work. So what we've been doing so far is focusing on some locus like this one and saying, okay, well, we're gonna compare the phenotype that we see given the genotype. So straightforwardly, we're gonna count the number of this variant that we see in cases versus controls. So I didn't wanna show all of it, but let's say we have hundreds and hundreds more of these stretches of DNA. You can think of them as genes if you'd like. And these are the only three times that this variant pops up in the entire population. So that means that we see this variant, this specific allele, three times in cases and zero times in controls. Unfortunately, when you have counts that are that low, it is so hard to establish significance. Um, and it's just because you, just, you, you don't have enough to count it up. In that example where you have three versus zero, even if you have 10,000 cases and 10,000 controls, the lowest p-value you can get is 0.25. That's not genome-wide significant. That's not even nominally significant. So this is a big issue, and this is part of the reason that you have to think about other ways to approach rare variant analysis. So just to reinforce, the big issue is that we don't have enough counts of these rare variants to be able to look at them individually. We somehow need to aggregate things together so that we can improve our statistical power, 
um, to detect association. So one very easy way of going about this is to sequence more samples. I mentioned with that GWAS earlier, that schizophrenia GWAS, when they had 2,600 people, they didn't find anything. But we know from our studies that when you add 5,000 more, 10,000 more, we're pulling things out. And we do have genome-wide significant things for schizophrenia now, but we have a lot larger sample set. Unfortunately, this isn't always feasible. Sequencing people is really expensive. Doing extra chips is expensive, and maybe you don't even have access to that data. So another way to approach it is to group these rare variants together. You want to aggregate them all somehow. So a really easy way that you could think, or a straightforward way, is you just collapse them across a gene, for example. So you could say, is there a rare variant in this gene in a person? Just a yes, no. So when we look at our cases, we say, yeah, this one's got some rare variants, this one does too, this one gene here in this case doesn't. You can see the controls show a very similar pattern. So maybe this isn't actually going to help you distinguish the, between cases and controls, because it's really just a yes, no. So a little more complicated, you could count the number of the rare variants that are popping in the gene or whatever region or stretch of DNA you're looking at. So here we have two, one, two, this one has zero, three here. And it looks like maybe there's a little more in the cases, but not really. It's, it's kind of, again, hard to separate it out. So a more tricky way of looking at things is saying, OK, well, I'm just going to count all of these common SNPs the way I normally count them. And I want to collapse all of the rare ones. So I'm going to set some threshold, let's say 1%. Everything above 1%, I'm going to do my normal common variant association techniques that we've been talking about all afternoon. Everything below 1%, I'm going to collapse together in some way. And so this is really just you're testing what you can, and you're collapsing what you can't. And it, it has more power to detect association than either testing each locus by itself or collapsing everything together, because those are kind of weird. However, anyone that's familiar with genetics should know that variants aren't all going to be affecting phenotype. You're gonna, you could break it down roughly into three classes. They could increase someone's risk. They could be neutral. A lot of them are neutral. And they might actually have protective effects. However, if you're doing these studies and you're including neutral variation, it's diluting out your signal. And this is bad because it means it's getting rid of that power that's in the data to, det to detect the real associations. So we really want to focus on things that are risk and even the ones that are protective. We don't really want these. So what are some ways to go about increasing uh, having only risk or protective and getting rid of those neutrals? Well, straightforwardly, you could stratify by function. So you could look at each one of those rare variants that you're focused on. You could say, is this a synonymous change, or is it actually going to alter the protein that the gene codes for? So is it nonsense or missense? And you could break it up that way and say, OK, well, I would expect that these silent things that aren't affecting anything should be the same between cases and controls, but maybe the cases have more of the rare functional ones, more of those missense mutations. However, missense mutations are a mix of neutral to risk and benign, sorry, risk and protective on their own. Not all of missense mutations are going to be bad. So this is another way that you're still having some neutral variation in there, but you're trying to get rid of some of it. Another approach now is to weight by the allele frequency. So the more rare it is, the stronger a weight it has. So this is a way, the idea again is that if rare things are more likely to be deleterious, if you take those ultra-rare things, maybe you're going to have a higher percentage of deleterious, and you're going to be getting rid of some of those neutrals. So again, this is an approach to get rid of the neutral variation and keep as much of that deleterious risk or beneficial variation that you can. So the weights are the inverse of the control allele frequency for that variant. And you can do a rank sum test. I understand we didn't go through that, but the main point is to see how, much, how different it is. What's, Right. So when you're doing SNPs that aren't encoding regions, it's a lot harder to determine what's functional or not. This uh, weighted variant approach would allow you to ignore that. So it's, it's different ways. If you're looking at coded, coding regions, you can say functional or not functional. With encode and a number of other things, now the non-coding, we have a little bit more of an idea of what's functional and not. But there are a number of different approaches, and I'm just mentioning ideas of how you might want to filter variants so that you're increasing your power. Yes? Yeah, 
You're not. You're only testing the variable sites that you want. So it's the, yeah, so, and, the, uh, and some of the sites are going to be common variant sites. It's really whatever you choose to focus on. So in one gene, yeah, you might have 1,500 bases you could be testing, but let's say you, you define your allele frequency cutoff at a uh, hundredth of a percent, maybe you only have a handful of sites within each gene. So you're doing more tests than the number of genes, but it's not like three billion tests. And your rare variant association can be by gene. It doesn't always have to be genome-wide. So if you're doing a targeted study, a lot of what has happened in this field is they found a, a common SNP for a gene they decided to sequence underneath, and they find rare variants and common variants in the same gene that affect the same phenotype. So another approach is to do a variable threshold. So this is kind of adapting all of these burden tests. So you do, you complete a burden test, so those are the chi-squared values for different minor allele frequency cutoffs. You need to figure out which one works best. And you say, okay, well, for this gene that I'm looking at, this is the cutoff that I'm gonna use. And you can permute your data, so shuffle it around a little bit to determine what's significant. This is just another approach. However, you'll remember that things are this mix of protective and risk and neutral variation, if some region or some gene is important to a phenotype, you would expect that maybe there's a mixture of different variants that add to the phenotype. Maybe it's not all risk. Maybe another mutation makes this gene better and you get a protective effect. So regions that are important will actually look like mixtures and we want to be able to find those. So this is a little complicated, but I'm going to step you through it. If you're flipping a biased coin, so this is shown in black here, it means it's more likely to land on heads than tails, you'll get a distribution roughly like this. Okay, cool. What happens if you're flipping two coins? One of them's a normal one, 50% heads, 50% tails, but the other one uh, only lands on heads. It's heads on both sides. So you get a very similar mean um, of, the, of that mixed coin toss as you do from the biased coin toss. So over time, average, they look the same. However, what you'll notice is that the mixed coin toss has more in these marginals. It has more of these two heads, zero tails flips as opposed to um, the one-on-one, -on -one. and it has more of these zero heads to two tail flips. That's kind of confusion. I, I understand that, but this is getting at sort of this dispersion. So instead of following a normal pattern, we're seeing things out in the tails much more than we would expect to see. So tests such as C-alpha get after this, and this is another way to analyze rare variants. So let's say we have a variant that we see once in a data set. We can see it either once in a case or once in a control. That's represented by one zero or zero one. If we have two, that's like our coin flip, we can see it twice in cases, one in one, so one case, one control, or twice in controls, and so on for other types of rare variants. So for the data that we've been looking at this entire time, I put up our case control counts here. So this is that three to zero is talking about earlier. We see a one to one, a two to zero. And when we put it on that sort of pyramid figure that I was creating, this is what we're seeing. So we see one, one to zero, two, zero to ones. That's kind of how everything falls out. But what are we expecting to see? Well, we know that we expect it to look like a binomial. So if you flip a coin, this is a, two through nine, if you flip a coin twice, you expect that 50% of the time you're gonna get one heads, one tails, 25% two heads, and 25% two tails. And so the size represents how likely that is to occur. You'll see that most of this falls in the middle and you've got these little tails over here. So when we're doing some of these over dispersion tests, what we're looking for is out in these tails. We're trying to find the instances where you're getting more two to zeros and you're getting more zero to twos as opposed to what you're expecting to see. So I'm going to use real data to, again. So roughly 100 people with high triglyceride levels and 100 people with low triglyceride levels were taken and their ApoB gene was sequenced. And so you can think of one as cases and one as controls, but we're comparing two groups here. And so what we see is this is the distribution of some of these rare variants. So for these things that were seen twice, we have a two to zero. For the things that were seen three times, a three to zero, two to one, et cetera. I really want to highlight one row, however, so that we had two variants that we saw six times total in this study. They happen to fall as, as a six to zero and a zero to six. So that means one of these variants was only seen in cases and the other one was only seen in controls. 
And really, we expect most of this stuff to fall in the middle, so that's kind of strange. And this is roughly the way that the overdispersion tests work. So just to sort of wrap it up so that you can go home and not be brain fried, rare variants aren't seen enough for you to use all of those classical association tests that we've been talking about all day. They're a little tricky. A couple of ways that you can put it together is you can collapse them across a gene. You can count the number, you can weight by frequency, you can look at function if it's coding, or you can search for overdispersion, that's C alpha. So these are all of the references that I cited. I should probably should have put journals down, but you can look into it more if you have other questions. With that, I think we're ready for you to escape.